Uh, hello, and welcome everybody to my talk about a common bypass pattern to exploit modern web apps. So uh, let's just get the introduction out of the way. Who am I? Uh, my name is Simon. I am a vulnerability researcher for Sonar Source. I work in the same team as Toma, which I'm uh, very lucky for. Um, I focus on finding uh, disclosing vulnerabilities with my teammates, uh, mainly in open source software. Uh, a couple of examples of software we found vulnerabilities include WordPress, Magento 2, MyBB, Zimbra, and the Linux kernel. Um, don't worry if you're unfamiliar with some of these targets, and we'll go into more details on the next slides. And uh, I also like to travel, which is why I'm super happy to be here in Geneva. So my goal for this talk is to go into detail uh, about some bug chains we found in popular web applications um, that have already been hardened and uh, the methodology we use to find them. So uh, first on the list is a WordPress one-click RC via CSERF. Uh, the idea was to create a comment on a WordPress block uh, which shows up in the admin dashboard um, because by default an admin has to log in and actually approve comments made by external guests, meaning unauthenticated, unauthenticated guests. So, and when the admin views the comment, they're tricked into uh, going on your attacker controlled website and then a CSER vulnerability uh, triggers and executes arbitrary code. And this happened back in the day when same site uh, cookies weren't enforced. So this actually worked and wasn't just a theoretical issue. Um, so yeah. And then next up, we have found a bug, a bug chain in Magento 2. Uh, Magento is an e-commerce solution. Um, and we found a pre of stored XSS into the admin uh, panel. And uh, the next time an employee logs into the admin panel, um, you know, uh, RCE exploit was triggered. And we found a similar bug chain in MyBB, which is a popular forum software where an attacker could send an admin a private message or have them view a post. And whenever they viewed this message, XSS triggered again, exploiting RCE. And last but not least, uh, we have a bug in Simbra, which is an enterpri enterprise email solution um, where we found yet again an XSS, um, which uh, triggered in the email body. So whenever uh, a user of a targeted organization would log in and view an email, uh, they wouldn't have to actually click anything. Uh, XSS would just trigger and the attacker could stall, steal all their emails. And uh, we found uh, SSRF, which could be triggered by any user of an organization, meaning if anyone just clicked on an email, uh, the SSRF would trigger, steal potentially um, cloud tokens, and uh, return it to the attacker server. So some of these applications have been hardened through years of bug bounty programs. Um, and there's competition zero day market. So some of these bugs are actually, you know, being sought after by SSD and the likes and CDI and, um, static analysis, static analyzers have been thrown at them as well. There have also been security audits, but the bugs still occur. And the question is why? And that is what we're going to discuss in the next slides. So, um, I feel like the way we find web security bugs is changing for modern apps. So we've seen a traumatic increase in adaption of mitigations and secure by default framework. So in the past, you know, uh, a PHP app uh, would simply, you know, you'd have a script and then uh, you would escape, you would uh, echo user input and then you'd escape it on the spot instead of having a templating engine that would, you know, make sure everything is escaped by default and kind of um, so there are t tons of great sanitization libraries available and they're quite easy to use, making it appealing for developers to actually use them uh, because they're just, you know, not a pain um, to integrate in your project. And in general, I would say security awareness has greatly improved among developers, at least for these huge projects uh, that are modern. So whenever a new mitigation or sanitization framework is deployed, we have to look, we have to look for, um, for bugs in places that are not covered by this new mitigation. So, um, um, this forces us to improve security research and invent new ways to find vulnerabilities. So this means instead of finding a place where they forgot to escape user input, we would actually have to come up with a way to either break um, the sanitizer um, to begin with or find a place where they wrongly use the sanitizer. Um, so, you know, we get the same bugs, but in a different way. So, for example, parser differentials are one of my personal favorite bug classes. Uh, the basic idea is that you have two uh, different components of an application. For example, a component that validates untrusted user input and one component that actually uses it. And if it, they don't agree uh, on how to parse this data, um, there can be security issues. And Orange Side did an incredible job at demonstrating this with differences in URL parsers and file system parsers. And those then led to good old path traversal bugs. And HTTP request smuggling is another great example of this. Um, also, just in general, whenever a standard leaves room for interpretation or there are some unintended side effects, for example, uh, PHP 
uh, far deserializations were a new way a couple years ago um, to get the same old PHP unserialized bugs that we've been exploiting for years. And another example of you know more sophisticated ways are maybe race, race conditions or time of check, time of use bugs. Um, but essentially, we're still finding the same old vulnerability types like XSS and SQL injection and other injections, but kind of we have to get more creative to get to them. So we, I, I mentioned a couple and something we felt wasn't getting enough attention uh, was another common mistake we saw everywhere, which was modification of sanitized data. Um, and this is what we're going uh, into in this talk and uh, just give some examples um, on what we mean by this. So uh, the mandatory hacker code picture. And although I'm usually a bit put off by images uh, by like this when I see them in articles, uh, I think it represents quite well how in intimidating it can feel like to look at the new code base, at least for me. Um, there might be millions of lines of code across several um, GitHub repositories and different services, and um, there might be different programming languages involved, and there's a front end and a back end, and you have no idea how everything fits together. So for this reason, we want to build a model kind of so we can concentrate on what is important to us and what isn't, so we can cut through millions of lines of code because we can't just read the application line by line and um, expect bugs to fall out. So uh, let's use some pseudocode to describe a model. In this example, uh, we have some user input. Uh, this can be anything. This could be your HTTP getter post parameter. This could be an HTTP header that is received. Uh, that is a file that was uploaded or generated from user input. Anything where you have untrusted data in. Um, in the example above, um, we see that this is sanitized. It's just could be anything. This is, you know, on an abstract level here. This could be your uh, HTML escaping. This could be your SQL escaping. This could be checking that a file name uh, works. And then you use the data in some way. So that's general, generally how it works. However, in the real world, usually things are more complicated. Like you'd have um, your user input is transformed. It's normalized. It's validated. It's sanitized. It's processed. Um, and it's important to note that these steps, they're not, it's, they're not always like, um, at the same um, code in, in the next code lines. Like sometimes there are millions of lines of code apart and sometimes it's not even explicit uh, when something gets normalized, for example, and we'll get into some examples with this later. But just to give you some examples of something we observed commonly happens in web applications with user input for transformation. So you would have something like converting short codes to HTML. Uh, we typically see this in forums or some kind of uh, what you see is what you get editor where you have like a back end um, format for shortcuts or uh, modifying or adding HTML attributes to an HTML string. So let's say an application takes in um, HTML input from a user or a document that was generated from user input. It could be your, um, if you have an online store, it could be your template for uh, emails that are sent to customers, whatever it is. And you kind of want to make sure um, that the HTML code is SEO friendly by making it clean, making sure it's accessible. So you want to make sure you add all, you know, you add attributes just to make sure uh, it's clean HTML code has a good store, a good score. Um, censoring of text, uh, let's say you have a chat application, you want to make sure your users don't say, na uh, don't send nasty messages to each other. You can remove uh, swear words, for example. Um, and there's also uh, auto URL highlighting. That's super common in chat applications, mail apps. Whenever you send someone a message and they detect, okay, there's uh, something like www.google.com, then they transform it into like a clickable link uh, just to make sure it's easy to use and uh, useful. And uh, language translations are also a common, uh, common thing to do. So uh, looking at our code example here, another step in the typical life cycle of user input uh, processing would be normalization. So uh, let's look at some examples what this could mean. So uh, Unicode normalization and text encoding normalization in general. So you want to make sure that all your services, for example, your web app and your database and your caches and whatever, that they all agree on a character set and that they consistently use it. Otherwise, you might run into some issues. Uh, path normalization, say you want to um, build a real path from user input and kind of resolve the path. That's something that happens. Or converting backslashes to forward slashes. Um, if you have an app, commonly Java, that can run on multiple OSs kind of to make sure all your paths are normalized and uh, actually work for the assets, the OS it's designed for. Uh, length, length truncations are quite common. For example, uh, some fields of a database might only be able to contain n characters. And if there's user input that is longer than n characters, it will be truncated uh, to the defined length. 
And uh, last but not least, all your services need to agree on uh, how many times user input should be URL encoded and decoded just to have kind of, um, you know, a common base, a normalized base across your services. So uh, last but not least, let's look at the sanitization step. And um, could be, um, well, this is more uh, validation when you have extension checks, when you will let your users upload files and you want to make sure uh, they don't contain any malicious uh, file names or file extensions. Um, this could be with an allow list or a deny list, whatever approach you want to take. Um, HTML escaping is, you know, the backbone, <laughs> making sure you don't have XSS everywhere. And the same applies for escaping input for your SQL queries. Um, just make sure your apps don't explode whenever someone enters a single code. And then uh, you want to validate your input against the allow list in general. Say you have a RPC service, remote procedure calls, and you want to let uh, users call methods. You want to make sure they can only allow, uh, can only call, can only call methods that are actually allowed and not just any random method in the code, which might lead to RCE. So let's get to the fun part and think about how this could break. Um, so looking at this pseudocode, we can see an application accepting user input and they sanitize it. And the resulting data is then normalized and afterwards transformed again. Um, and then it is used. And this is possibly insecure. Because when sanitized data is modified in some way, the effects of the sanitization could be negated um, or possibly even worse. So sanitization should always be the very last step before using data. And we'll uh, get into more examples here. However, sanitized data tends to be trusted and used less carefully um, because, you know, you're a developer and you've done your deed and <laughs> you threw the sanitizer at it. And now everyone's happy and now you can do whatever you want with your input. But it isn't exactly how it works in uh, in the real world, and also it isn't always obvious if and how where if how and where data is modified after it has been sanitized. There are cases where data is modified by some other service before being used in an entirely different GitHub repo maintained by a different team. So you don't have a perfect overview uh, over it. And also, I noticed that a lot of uh, bone researchers, when they look at code and they see some user input is validated or escape, they just stop following uh, the user input and they don't look for a place where it's, in a, where it's modified after and perhaps you can bypass the sanitization step. So let's get into some case studies. And the first one we have here is Simbra Webmail. And um, we mentioned this before, it's an enterprise um, email solution. It can be used um, as an alternative to Microsoft uh, Exchange, for example. And according to their sales website, there are over 200,000 businesses, government, and financial institutions that are using it. And actually, in February, Volexity published a blog post uh, where they de detected a zero-day campaign um, against Simbra, and they assumed that it was a state actor because government instances were the main targets of these attacks. Um, so it goes to show it is an interesting target used by governments. And um, email bodies can contain arbitrary HTML code, and uh, it must be carefully sanitized, and there's a lot that can go wrong here. So we chose it as an interesting target uh, for pawning. So we discovered an XSS vulnerability in the email body and an SSF vulnerability that allowed stealing cloud provider credentials, for example, from AWS or even Google Cloud. With Google Cloud, you usually need to send a header. But in the SSRF, you could actually send arbitrary headers, meaning you could even steal Google Cloud tokens, uh, which was pretty cool. So one email is enough to potentially take over an email server uh, of an organization. Uh, just someone needs to click it. And uh, we have a little demo prepared here. Uh, let me just switch tabs. Okay, so <laughs> I wrote my uh, little fancy, oh, my little fancy attacker dashboard here. And uh, let me just skip back. Okay. So what we're looking at here is the attacker dashboard that I wrote. It's you know just for demonstration purposes. And we basically have an attacker launching an attack against employee at target-organization.org. Um, and when the attacker presses this button, an email is sent to this uh, victim. And now we're switching to the victim's view. They're logging into their Simpra instance. And now they have a new email. And, you know, you can take as much security training in the world and be as careful as you want and not click on any links in any emails. But at some point, you're going to have to emails. You're going to have to open emails. So there's a new email. They click it. And there's nothing to click. There's nothing evil going on. There's just an awfully cute puppy. Um, and they view the email. And while they're viewing the email, XSS payload runs in the back. So now we're back in the attacker panel. And when we reload, we'll see that we have leaked all the emails um, 
of this client. And well, there's one email with office banter as a subject, so that's probably not interesting. And uh, just for traumatic purposes, there's an email uh, with the subject of access to production environment. So <laughs> that might be interesting. And we have also leaked uh, IAM credentials. And when we read the email of the victim, we now have access to production environment. It's probably not that easy in the real world, but for demonstration purposes, uh, I hope <laughs> it's fine. Okay. So let's look at how the vulnerabilities actually came to be. Um, so we looked at the sanitization of email bodies in Zimbra, and the email bodies were sanitized on a server site, and they used an allow list of HTML tags and attributes, which is generally speaking the good way to go. Oh, sorry, thank you for pointing this out. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, server-side sanitization, they use server-side sanitization and they use an allow list of HTML tags and attributes, uh, which is the way to go in my opinion. Uh, denial list never actually works. And um, they use the OWASP Java HTML sanitizer. Um, it's a library maintained by OWASP. And we did not discover a bypass in this HTML sanitizer framework. So, or for, and additionally, there was very strict encoding, uh, meaning all the... Uh, um, the ampersands and the uh, angle brackets and the quotes and single quotes, they would all be escaped in text and attribute values. So our thought was, hey, um, we'll have to start looking for a place where the sanitized email is modified after it has been sanitized just to find a bypass for this. So um, we found a code snippet in a JavaScript file located in another repository that does exactly this for us. So it wasn't immediate obvious. So. Uh, for background, emails can contain calendar invites, so whenever you invite someone for a meeting, that's just a calendar invite, basically. And uh, if such an invite was present, the front-end JavaScript file was used to truncate the HTML description of the invite. It's basically just, you know, having a fancy read more button for calendar invites. And so let's look at actual code. Um, if the JavaScript file checked if there was invite content, and if there was, um, it would uh, enter after checking some other ha headers, which I don't know anything about, um, they entered the truncate body content function, um, and they called, they passed the content variable to it, which contains the string of the sanitized HTML data um, that is partially attacker controlled, partially because it's been sanitized. So, then it, within that function, they created a wrapping diff tag, um, just creating a, and then they set the content to the inner HTML uh, of this wrapping diff. What this does is it will utilize the browser and the browser will then parse this HTML string and build a DOM object tree from it. And uh, it just allows you to just kind of search within this DOM object tree by ID and class and do all sorts of modifications to it. Um, and it's, it's kind of neat. And uh, after all of this processing, which we're actually not interested in, basically they just added a read more button, um, they returned the inner HTML string. Now something interesting happened here, um, because setting the user controlled and sanitized HTML content to dot inner HTML of a wrapping diff um, decodes HTML entities in user controlled data. So uh, this is because browsers parse the inner HTML string and convert it to a DOM object tree, as I said, and they normalize it kind of in their browser-specific way. There are some standards, but there's deviations and uh, whatever. So when the dot inner HTML string is then read, the DOM object tree is converted to HTML, and we now have the normalized version, which now has decoded entity. And this does not lead to XSS directly, but it's important for the next step. And we'll show how this would look like in a, with a real user input in just a second. So the same JavaScript file um, transformed the normalized data uh, further, so it looks for form tags without an action attribute. Uh, the reason for this is that emails can contain forms, and if you don't, because they use the server-side sanitization to throw out anything that could potentially be harmful, but they couldn't actually check if a ta if an attribute was not set. So if a form tag doesn't contain an action attribute, which dictates where the form should be submitted to, it goes to this current page, and technically you could forge a CSERF attack. Um, so they would try to find all form tags without an action attribute, and then set a default one just to kind of prevent these kinds of attacks. So, you know, looking at code, and please don't be scared, because I was <laughs> when I saw the regex here for the first time. Uh, basically, all it does is it uses regex to find any forms within the HTML, which has now been decoded. 
um, to find form tags. And if they do, um, they just insert the attribute action equals, and I can never say this, same host form post blocks uh, action attribute, just kind of killing all these CSERF attacks. So let's actually look at some code and let's assume the following HTML uh, that was sent in an email uh, to a victim and we can see an HR tag. It's harmless, so it's um, left by the, uh, by the sanitizer and there's an align attribute and within this align attribute, there's a form tag. And we can maybe see already where this is going. And there's a second attribute, the no shade attribute. And this contains a script alert document, um, dot domain. And although, you know, it looks nice, there's a script tag. It's actually completely harmless if you were to render this in your browser because the form and script tag are, um, encapsulated in double quotes and they're interpreted as an attribute value instead of, um, tags. So after the sanitization step, um, even the ankle brackets have been escaped, um, and this is even more harmless. However, now um, we can force the browser to decode these entities again by setting the .inner HTML string, um, kind of leading to a bypass of this encoding. And I said before, this does not lead to XSS directly, but it's important for the next step because now the regex that's looking for form tag can actually max, uh, match the form tags within the align attribute. And what this means is the action attribute, the default action attribute is inserted within the align attribute. And this kind of leads to uh, an imbalance of double quotes um, within uh, the HR tag, meaning the script alert is now actually interpreted as an element instead of an attribute string, um, which then leads to XSS when it's viewed, to, uh, viewed by uh, a victim. So... To summarize the Zimra vulnerability, uh, here's what happened when looking at the code through the lens of our model. Um, first, the user input is sanitized on the server side, and then it was normalized by the .inner HTML normalization. And afterwards, the form replacements were kind of transformations on the code. And finally, it was used and was displayed to the user, leading to XSS. Okay, so um, let's look at the next case study, uh, which is WordPress. And yesterday when I checked just before uh, updating the slides, um, the download page of WordPress says that 43% um, of websites on the internet use it. I mean, I don't know where they have their number from, but it's the on download page. Um, and it has a comment form enabled by default. So any uh, unauthenticated visitor can just uh, create a comment. And this comment can contain raw HTML code. And um, we finally ended up discovering a chain of vulnerabilities leading to CSERF to RCE impact in default settings. And I mentioned this earlier, uh, at the same same site cookies were in enforced, so this would actually work. So um, I mentioned the comment form before, and uh, they were not protected by a nonce, and this will get important later. And they can contain raw HTML code, which becomes sanitized. Um, and they have actually a very strict list of uh, tags and attributes that are allowed. So it's extremely limited. You can make your text bold. You can, uh, you know, uh, make the text cursive or underline it, or you can include links, but that's about it. However, for admins, this sanitization list is a bit relaxed. You can include some more um, tags like images and tables, but it's still secure. Um, at least at, we didn't find a bypass. So the WordPress HTML sanitizer has been hardened for years, and I think everyone tried to break it before, and I definitely didn't manage it. Um, so we were kind of hoping that maybe there's a place where we can apply our little trick again. And uh, it uses an allow list for HTML tags and attributes, one for admins, one for unauthenticated users. And we did not discover a bypass for the sanitizer. So look for a place where it was modified. And we found a transformation of the comment where a tags, like meaning links, um, are actually transformed. So for SEO purposes, you want to make sure that a rel attribute is present. Um, this kind of just gives search engine uh, some hints about how to parse the page and just kind of improves your score so that you are shown on a higher um, entry on uh, Google results, for example. And only administrators could set this rel attribute. Um, an unauthentic unauthenticated user can't, um, which is fine because we can just see surf the comment form and create a comment containing the rel attribute and uh, WordPress parse the ATEX, um, which have already been sanitized. So all evil attributes have been thrown out and they created kind of a key value array or a map um, with all the attribute values and the ATEX are then constructed back together after processing the rel attribute. So let's look at some code. 
And uh, what we can see here is the key value map of attributes in the uh, ads uh, array. And on the first line, um, it is checked if it's empty or if the rel attribute exists. And if it does, uh, it will process it. And again, this isn't actually relevant uh, to us, what we're trying to do here. And then the attribute value string needs to be constructed back together. So you would have something like title equals double code some value, blah, blah, blah. And then you have the href equals something. And this needs to be constructed back together. So they iterated over all the attributes that were previously parsed. And then they set the uh, name uh, equals uh, double quote, the value double quote, and concatenate everything back together. Note there's no uh, encoding here. And then they just uh, return the string again. And this is kind of used uh, to sanitize comments, uh, to transform comments. So let's assume the following input. And some people might already know where this is going. We have uh, a tag here with a title. And it's encapsulated using single quotes. And there's a XSS and there's a double quote. Uh, and then there's an on mouse over equals evil code string. And an ID, another double quote, and the final single quote. And again... Uh, it would be nice if we could just include the onmouse over uh, event handler on the raw HTML, but we can't because it's kicked out. And um, however, you know, there might be a way. And then there's also the rel attribute set. Now, we saw just in a slide before how everything is back concatenated back together using double quotes. So after the concatenation, our uh, input would look like the following, where the rel no follow tag is set after it's been processed. And then suddenly you have the title attribute uh, encapsulated in double quotes. And because nothing was escaped, we can now actually inject the onmouse over uh, event handler. And it's now interpreted as an attribute instead of a string, uh, leading to XSS when an admin would hover over the uh, mouse, uh, would hover, use their mouse to hover over the A tag. And we could also inject this dial tag and make the uh, link like an invisible overlay over the entire page. So basically it triggers instantly. Um, and to summarize, um, with this bug, input was again escaped and afterwards transformed and used. And that's all we were doing, basically. We we're just looking for places where things were transformed uh, after it was sanitized. So I prepared a little demo again. Okay, so on the left side, we'll have the attacker um, launching their little exploit server. And on the right side, we have um, a WordPress page where an admin will log in. So we're starting an exploit server on port 1337, of course. And then uh, we want to run the command ID on the targeted WordPress server. And then we have the admin logging in. And now they see a new comment has been created and it says, uh, hey, uh, admin, I uh, thought this blog post was really great and here's an interesting URL. I left some criticism here. And of course, your ego stinks now and you want to see what someone had to say about your blog post. So you click on the link. And now the victim is kind of just seeing the Insomniac logo and just viewing. But on the left side, we can see that a connection was made to the exploit server. And now we're create we're exploiting the C surf to create the comment. Now that the comment was created containing the XSS payload, we can actually display it on the same page in another iframe and make the iframe follow around the victim's mouse, um, just so that the almost over event handler would trigger. And then we're checking if the XSS worked, and it did. Uh, we got a connection, and now we're uploading a shell. So in WordPress, you can uh, just upload a shell as an admin, basically, because you can upload plugins containing PHP code. And then we see the output of the ID command here, and we have RCE. Okay, so let's get to our final case study, and uh, just uh, this is a quick one, and then afterwards we'll summarize, and um, we'll be done. So uh, Magento 2, um, we said earlier, it's an e-commerce solution that is used by thousands of companies to uh, handle hundreds of billions of dollars in annual transactions. And there's some people here in the audience that are really uh, well-versed in Magento. And it's a popular target uh, hacking group motivated by financial gain. Um, for example, Magecard has been observed to utilize zero days against Magento 2 stores. Um, so it's a popular target. And... We looked at um, a post of RCE and low-privileged employees could create a sitemap uh, XML file 
Um, that's just kind of another hint for your search engines on how to parse uh, the site and you know just to index some interesting pages. And the file names had to end with the .xml extension, so you could control the file name, could control the file name, but there, there was there had to be an XML extension. And the file name and content were stored in the database. And uh, when desired, the sitemap file could then be generated and written to disk. And the file name check was secure, unfortunately for us as attackers. And um, however, again, we looked at the place where stuff is uh, normalized afterwards. And the database column for the file name was limited to 32 characters. Um, and there was no length check. However, the database driver would truncate the file name to 32 characters if it was too long. So what this means in practice is we can create a file name like the first one, which is 36 characters long, but ends with the .xml extension and thus checks, you know, it, it passes the check by Magento. However, after it's been stored to the database, uh, it turns into a .php file and uh, we can just ask Magento to generate the file, then write it to disk, and then we have RCE because we have uploaded a shell. Um, so that's another example of something being normalized and actually being implicitly normalized um, because, you know, the database, MySQL, just does it without, you know, you ever knowing that it, trunc it was truncated and the developers technically didn't do anything wrong. Um, it was kind of, uh, you know, just an unknown side effect uh, where normalization took place of validated data, which just goes to show whenever you have data that's sanitized, it's not, you know, it's not time to stop looking. Um, there might be a way to bypass. And um, yeah, so we have another demo. Um, so this one, we use a kind of a fancy rip shell. What we're seeing here is the attacker um, being on a targeted store and using some JavaScript uh, to launch a fancy rip shell uh, just for dramatic purposes. Um, I used to work for Rips, uh, which was acquired by Sonar Source just for context. So they now, and I mentioned earlier, we found a post uh, pre auf stored XSS into the admin panel. So in this exploit chain video, the attacker is unauthenticated and then they register account, a customer account on the website and they create an order, cancel the order. Um, and within the order cancellation notice, there was the XSS payload, which actually worked because of a similar trick again, uh, but I wanted to keep this short. Um, and now we're waiting for an administrator or any employee to view uh, the canceled order. And in the real world, this could take days or even weeks. Um, but just for dramatic purposes for the video, this will happen instantly um, where the administrator views the uh, order. And as soon as they do, the XSS payload triggers and executes um, the RCE exploit we just demonstrated. And now we have a shell on the Magento store. So, yeah. So, um, just to summarize, um, abstracting vulnerabilities helps find bugs, helps to find bugs in highly complex and large code bases because we want to have something we want to focus on. And, um, abstraction also helps keeping the big picture in mind uh, when auditing projects. And yeah, just my personal tip is my, my little go-to trick uh, nowadays. So whenever, um, there's something sanitized, I don't stop looking. Um, I just look for a place where this is somehow uh, modified. Uh, the data and then um, sanitization for developers should always be the last step um, and never do anything with your data after it's been sanitized, except for using it, of course. Um, and then blog posts, um, you know, you can see that we can read the details about the Magento XSS on our blog. Um, it's blog.sonarsource.com and we would love your help at Sonarsource to find bugs. Um, so if you want to join us and do similar things, we're hiring. And yeah, you can reach out to me on Twitter, ask me any questions. Or uh, if you ever find a bug with this pattern or have found bugs with this pattern, it uh, would be really cool to hear and read your write-up. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Now, uh, if there are any questions. Uh... Uh, hello, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so I was wondering, this methodology that you show in this uh, bug, um, bug class where the um, like um, unsafe things happen after the sanitization, it seems that it could be 
found by static analysis, maybe, with all the usual caveats about static analysis. Have you seen or done any attempts of uh, automatization with this regard? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think that RIPS detected some instances in the case, or so old static analyzer, because you can just kind of check, okay, is my user input here, and what happens with it, and then you can see would this transformation kind of make exploitation possible again. So it's definitely possible you would just have to, I'm personally not a engineer uh, for a static analysis, so I'm just way out of my water here. But in general, yeah, you can detect, um, you can mark something as sanitized or validated, and then you can keep following the data flow and just check if it's uh, modified in any way and then just raise a warning or something. Yeah, because currently it's like a static analysis, like where when the data is sanitized, it's after that it's considered saved usually and no like no sync analysis is done. So I was wondering if you know of any products that uh, that go with your like solution. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Is there any other question? No, sir. Then thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs>